Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to the last session of uh, this Simpa School, so which is intended to be a kind of a tutorial of uh, the keywords or maybe some more details uh, by Cordian around the problem and the conjecture he stated. Over to you, Cordian. Very much. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I was really thinking a lot of what to do in this last section, and I tried to give you something because, I mean, okay, I, I feel also that some of the things that I said may have been a little bit uh, different from what uh, people in the audience were maybe working on. So I tried to find a concrete set of interesting com uh, commutative algebra questions or interesting objects to study in commutative algebra that maybe someone in the audience would be really interested to look at and help me solve questions that I have with that. And um, so, so let me just start by again saying a, a small definition, which you all have seen before. Uh, if I have a polynomial ring and I have a natural symmetric group action by permuting the variables, I will just say that I, an ideal is symmetric if it is closed under this action, right? I mean, it doesn't mean that the, the polynomials themselves are, invari uh, are invariant uh, so symmetric polynomials, but it just means that the ideal is closed by this action. Okay. Um, for example, we have already seen this polynomial implicitly before. If I take this ideal generated by x i times x i minus one, then this obviously is a symmetric ideal. So this falls into this class of symmetric ideals. Very good. Um, so again, the, the interesting thing is now I can start with one ideal. Uh, for a fixed n, zero, I start with this ideal and I can get a new ideal in a new number of variables in a higher number of variables by just taking the previous ideal, lifting it up to the polynomial ring in more variables and then let the symmetric group act on this ideal. So the, the symmetric group in n, uh, in n uh, on n letters, I let it act on this ideal in n uh, zero many variables, and then this naturally gives me a new ideal in, in more variables that is still symmetric. So I think you have seen this this kind of ideals uh, before in the in the in the talk by um, I don't. In, the, in the talks on these on these uh, these graphical models. Okay, so why why does this have anything to do with what I have been talking about? So I want to bring a little bit the representation theory of the symmetric group into the setup. So as I mentioned during one of the lectures already, there's a beautiful connection between the representation theory of the symmetric group and combinatorial objects. And the combinatorial objects that I want to look at now are partitions. We already had partitions. So partitions for me is just a set of decreasing positive integers that sum up to a given number n. Okay, And from every partition, I can build a so-called Young tableau, which is just a visualization of the of this partition uh, in boxes where I put in the numbers one to n. So this is maybe a very very complicated sounding sounding definition. So it's much easier to understand this definition from an example. I have the number ten. The number ten is four plus three plus one plus one plus one. So this is a partition of ten. It's the sequence of decreasing positive numbers. To this partition, I can associate a Young tableau, which consists of four boxes in the first row, three boxes in the second row, and then one box, one box, one box. So it's like a table. And I assign the numbers one to n in any fashion that I want to this Young tableau. Okay, that's that defines a so-called Young tableau. Excuse me. Yes. What what is uh weakly decreasing positive integer what uh, weakly mean? decreasing just means that i can have repetitions ah okay so one one i mean it's not strictly i mean strictly decreasing would be that i only allow sequences that that you know that go down every step and here i have uh, one one so it's just weakly decreasing okay thank you you're absolutely welcome so this is a this is a very nice combinatorial object and now I, you see already that I also have a group action of the symmetric group on this object. Namely, I can have the symmetric group um, permute on these, these entries of my, of my Young tableau. Okay, so, but you are more into commutative algebra. So let's 
let me let me build polynomials out of a young tableau. Um, so now take um, um, for for a finite set of numbers, let's just agree on the the definition of delta of s being just the Vandermond determinant in these indices in the variables with the indices in the set. This also sounds a little bit horrible the way I say it, but it is just this pairwise, it is product of these pairwise differences of xij minus xik, where i and uh, I, I, j and ik are in my set S. Okay, so for every finite set of, of numbers, I get such a polynomial, which I call a Vandermont determinant associated to the set. So if the set would be the number one to n, I would get the normal Vandermont determinant. If the set is any subset of the numbers one to n, I get a, a Vandermont determinant, if you want, of a minor of the Vandermont matrix. Okay. Now, how do we bring our, our young tableau into the play now? So take any young tableau, then I associate to a young tableau a specht polynomial by multiplying over the different Vandermont variety, Vandermont, uh, Vandermont determinants of the columns of this young tableau. Again, the definition sounds completely complicated, so let's not spend too much time on the definition. Let's look at a concrete example. So I take this young tableau, which is now the, the partition. The partition that we have is four, three, one. I have filled it with numbers, the numbers from one to eight. And what I do now is I look at the first column. The first column is four, eight, three. So I have the Vandermond determinant of, 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 of these three numbers, four, eight, and three, which gives me exactly the first three, factors of this polynomial. And then I do the same with the second column. The second column consists only of two and seven. The Vandermont determinant of the two numbers two and seven is just the pairwise difference between x2 minus x7. And the same for the last, uh, for the middle column six and five, I have x6 minus x5. In the last column, I only have a one. And because I only have a one, I mean, the, the m is almost, it's just a one. Um, the, it's just x to the zero, x, 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 x one to the zero. So I have, the important thing is I have this young tableau, which is this combinatorial object. I look at the columns. I build very simple polynomials out of these columns. And, and these are called Specht polynomials. So just as a, as a historical note, so these polynomials were constructed by Wilhelm Specht in the 30s to construct the irreducible representations of the symmetric group. So this connects to the first lecture or the also the, the fourth lecture where we have been talking about the representation theory of the symmetric group a bit. One can show that all irreducible representations of the symmetric group can be built with these young tableaus. But that's not the point. The main point now is just Combinator, uh, commutative algebra, let's just look at those polynomials and just can look the, at an ideal <clears throat> waveform. Can the column entries uh, be same? Say again, sorry, I didn't hear it. Uh, so, so the young tableau contains the column entries same. Uh, what happens so, in uh, that case? Sorry, yes. That, that <clears throat> For example, we have four, eight, and three in the first column. Yes. What if we have four, four, and three? Oh, here, okay, you're absolutely right. Here, the numbers need to be the numbers need to be distinct. So, in in the filling, so the, okay, there's a very there's a very good question because I I, I spend too much time spinning. So the, the the tableau could be in the tab. So the not the, the 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 repetition can appear in the partition. So I can have I mean here I have four three one as a partition. I could also have four three three one. Then I would have another row in here. But the numbers that I fill into the rows and columns in the, into those boxes, they have to be unique. If they are not unique, you're absolutely right, then we would have a problem because then we would get a zero immediately. That would be a very boring polynomial. Okay? Okay. Is the definition of this polynomial clear? <clears throat> is, it a, is there a specific uh, algorithm to make young tableau or there is a specific algorithm? Yes, you can you can build young tableaus. I mean, uh, 
Um, I mean, if you have a partition, I mean, it's you build a young tableau just by 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 putting these boxes, and then you put in all the numbers. What is more interesting is that you don't need. I mean, for for actually, what we will look now is an ideal. I mean, the ideal generated by all of these young tableaus. And I mean, um, and by by all of them, I mean by all of the permutations that you get of these of these of these of these polynomials, and actually to generate the ideal, you need much less than all of them. And if you want to only calculate the, the those young tableau that you need to define um, the um, the ideal, there is there's actual algorithms to do that. They are very combinatorial, so they are they are so-called semi-standard young tableaus that you have to look at. But this is for the moment complete. I mean, this is a very good question, but for the moment, it's just a definition. We have this ideal, we have this polynomial. And if you want to, I look at this one polynomial, and then I have the group S8 acting on this polynomial. I take all the permutations of these eight variables, and I look at the ideal that is generated by these polynomials. So this is an ideal. Um, it's corresponding to a Specht polynomial or to the family of Specht polynomials. So we call it the Specht ideal associated with the partition mu. And of course, whenever we have a, whenever we have a, an ideal, we can look at the corresponding variety, which is just the the the, yeah, the variety corresponding to the ideal, and this will be just called the Specht variety. Okay, so now we have defined a combinatorially interesting object. You might think, why did we do that? Um, uh, let me just ah, let me just say something else, um, which will be important in just a minute. If I have the symmetric group acting on now, k can be any field. We can even have positive characteristic, um, non uh, um, the characteristic zero algebraically closed, non algebraically closed. I mean, at the moment, k can be any field, and I have a group action. Um, and then some points, some elements of my group will stabilize a point, right? I mean, we have already seen if I have repetitions in the coordinates, then my point will be stabilized by a subgroup. So I can associate to a point a stabilizer subgroup. And because we already agreed that this just means that some of the coordinates of my point repeat, I can just order those things and then I can sort of up to conjugacy associate a group of the form SL1 times SL2 times SLK to every point, which is exactly the conjugacy class of the corresponding orbit, uh, uh, of the corresponding um, stabilizer. And this number we will just call the orbit type of my point. So to every point. Essentially, I look at how many times the individual coordinates appear in this point, and I order these numbers uh, uh, increasing, uh, decreasingly, also weakly decreasingly, and I get again a partition, which is L1, L2, up to Lk, and this will be called the orbit type of a point. And we can also then look at a stratification of our, of our um, uh, we can look at, at the, 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 the points, all the points, um, that have exactly this orbit type. Okay. So now, now this this is interesting, and this brings these this brings these these definition maybe a little bit more concrete. If you think about the Vandermont determinant as a polynomial, the important property of a Vandermont determinant, not the important property, but an important property of the Vandermont determinant is that it vanishes. The way I build it, it vanishes if and only if one of the numbers is repeated, or more, at least one of the numbers is repeated, right? That is, that is a Vandermont, a Vandermont determinant evaluated at a set of points that are all distinct uh, will uh, will not vanish. But if at least one of these coordinates is repeated, I will get a zero, and this 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 gives us a very nice relationship between the orbit point of my point and um, and the inclusion of this point in a Specht variety. This is really not hard to prove. It's really just looking a little bit um, about when such a Specht polynomial can vanish and when it will not vanish. Oh, I should also mention, so here I write, there is a, there's a nice order on partitions, which is called the dominance order. And, and you can actually relate this inclusion to this dominance order. Okay, and what you get from this, and this is also not too hard to show, it's really just checking 
which points, I mean, for, for which are the conditions, how, if you take a point with repeated coordinates, how can you shift these coordinates to ensure that these spectral polynomials all will vanish? And then you know that the point is in, a in the spectral variety. And from that, you get a very simple result, namely you get that, I mean, something that is related to the combinatorics of these partitions, namely that one dominates the others. Um, you get an in is is equivalent to an inclusion of the corresponding spec ideals, which is then in, uh, equivalent to the containment of the corresponding varieties. Okay. So now, if you have all paid attention in um, commutative algebra, you would think, oh, containment of varieties and containment of ideals, there is a connection, and you're absolutely right. If the spec ideals are radical then, I mean, one of these things would be very immediate. And I, I say this now because when we proved this, actually it was our conjecture that these ideals are radical, um, but we couldn't show it. And it was later shown by uh, these three mathematicians from Japan who actually, and this is kind of very funny, actually remarked that all of this stuff had already been studied by a, a person called Alexander Wu in his PhD thesis from 2005, which was so, in the beginning of the internet that nobody really found this um, thesis online, which is just to say to all the PhD students, um, if you write a PhD thesis, make sure that it's publicly available because otherwise a lot of other people will be proved maybe the same results that you have, right? So it's very important to make sure that results are available for everybody so that people don't waste their time on reproving things that are already known. Um, so why is this interesting? So now let's look at the monomial. Um, uh, let's look at any monomial. And I can also look at the monomial and associate to a monomial a partition. And uh, um, so let me just, let me, again, these, these definitions make more sense by looking at an example. So suppose I look at the monomial x2, x4 to the 4, and x5 to the 5. And I assume that this monomial lives in, in 12 variables. I mean, I look at this monomials in a polynomial ring in 12 variables. So then I associate, I want to associate to it a partition of 12. And the way I do this is I, I, I add numbers to these to this, to this exponents here, such that I get to 5, 3, 2, 1, 1. Okay. Um, Right, so now I have a monomial, I have a point. So the important thing is I have a point, I can associate to a point, a partition. I have a monomial and I can associate to a monomial, a partition. Why did I do that? Um, so now the interesting thing is, um, and this ties things a little bit together. If ever I have a symmetric ideal, I, then I can always find, and, and then I assume that in this ideal, there is a monomial. There's a polynomial that uh, that has um, that has enough variables free. Then I can for every monomial, um, I can for every monomial. Maybe I should. So then I can actually show that this ideal that is generated by P contains a specht ideal for all partitions lambda that are not dominated by the monomial. The, the, the partition that I associate to my monomial. Okay, this is this is a very easy theorem actually to prove once you have this relation with ideals and you understand a little bit respect ideas and you understand a little bit what this means for 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 coordinates to be zero. Um, but um, so it's actually it's actually not hard to show this, but it's actually very beautiful and I want to show you quickly why I think this is a beautiful result. Um, because if you now take a symmetric ideal and you assume that in the symmetric ideal there is such a polynomial that fulfills the things that I, I stated, then we know that um, the intersection of my variety with the points of the specific orbit type will be empty. Okay? So you will already know that no point with orbit type so and so will be contained in my in my in my uh, in my points meaning that you already know that it will not intersect these 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 uh, these, these sections um 
So actually, when you when you work out this concretely, there will be a lot of those lambdas which cannot be contained, a lot of points which cannot be contained in your variety. And if you if you if you think about this this uh, a little bit, then you can actually show that the dimension of your variety will be at most d, namely that your variety can be only included. I mean, the po all the points that are included in your variety cannot have more than d distinct components. Maybe that's what I should have. Hey, what is components. h lambda here? Oh, H lambda, very good question. Sorry, I I I, I browsed over this too quickly. Going to the H lambda, H, okay. if you have a lambda, uh -huh. you have a lambda, it's a it's an orbit type, and H lambda are all the points with that given orbit H type. File. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very good. So this H lambda has some geometrical structure of the variety as well. Uh, ah, you're taking the H lambda, okay. This H lambda is okay. Actually, if you if you if you want H lambda, what does it mean? H lambda means that coordinates are equal. Yeah. Coordinates are equal exactly corresponding to lambda. So up to up to oh, topological yeah. closure, yeah. H lambda is just a union of hyper uh, of hyperplanes. Uh, it's a hyperplane, right? It's a hype. It's a hyperplane. Yes. I mean, the question is if you want if you want it to close or not. But it's it's it's, it's a hyperplane, the question is, you know, in, in this hyperplane, there is, for example, the zero point, and the zero point technically has a bigger orbit type because all the coordinates are equal. So technically it's 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 uh, it's it's an open it's 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 open dense in a in a in a hyperplane. Uh, can you can you go to the same slide uh, where the intersection with uh, sorry? where you were, where you were here? Next, 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 next. Yeah, yeah. Intersection, the intersection with each lambda. Next, next. Yeah, yeah. this one. So it, it uh, so V of I intersection with each lambda. So each lambda is of co-dimension one, right? Uh, each h lambda is not of co-dimensional h. I mean, it, it's a hyper. It's, it can be also a smaller dimensional subspace. Can be smaller dimension. Uh, how, it can be smaller how... dimensional. So, for example, if let me say, if if lambda is, for example, the trivial partition, then lambda h lambda will be all coordinates equal. Then it's just a line. Okay. And, and, and uh... it, yeah. Uh, can, uh, can you give us some, uh, some sense of uh, viewing this result of uh, the dimension of V of I and this intersection? Hey, maybe, maybe, maybe I should, maybe I should, maybe I should, maybe I should say a little bit more about this corollary. But I mean, it's okay. Okay. So what this corollary okay. actually means is okay. If I mean uh, one way of seeing this. So suppose that you can show. I mean, what we what we have showed here is that my ideal, my ideal, uh, if I have some condition on the polynomials. My ideal will contain all spec ideals that are are dominated by the. I mean, this is a this is a lot of things to digest. I'm seeing now. Will contain all the spec ideals that um, are uh, are um, are transposed to my original partition. So what will turn out is that this is are a lot of spec. This is a lot of ideals. But it means a lot of this means that a lot of these Vandermont determinants will have to vanish. And what you can show is that in this case, it means that every Vandermont determinant has to vanish that has where the, where the, where the coordinates are, where the columns are at least of length D. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that means that that translates into that your variety has to be, um, is forced to be a part of uh, some linear sub, a union of subspaces of uh, co-dimension n minus d. So it has to be d-dimensional. Okay. So this was a this was a little. I mean, this is. I, I realize it's a little bit. It's a yeah. little bit hard to maybe Too digest many. all of yeah. these things at once, and I'm I'm sorry for that. But, but I I just wanted to motivate that this ideal is a really beautiful oh. ideal to look at. Excuse me. Uh, what is this phi v in the uh, in the union? 
Oh, that's a very good question. So this I should have. So phi v is just a map. Oh, this is a. Uh, so here, I, in other words, I was I was I was saying okay, I quotient out the symmetric group, and then this phi, this map phi is exactly this quotient map. Is uh, 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 is a quotient of uh, the variety? Is a quotient of this symmetric group? Symmetric. So, I mean, so I, I I would I, so I, I quotient here. So here I quotient the variety with the symmetric group. I only count orbits, and then I I I I I I, I, I got this result here. So I should have said this. And uh, what is IV as it's a kind of a dual or something? Uh, it is, it is, it is, it is. So, so exactly, this is new. All this, all the partitions that are sort of exactly that are sort of not domin. They are not dominated by my 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 dual partition, if you want to say. So I mean, here I have so IV is the spect ideal corresponding to a partition new. And I mm -hmm. go over all the news that are not covered by a dual partition. So it's a kind of it's a kind of a spec dual of the idea. Exactly. Yeah, you can say like this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So the other consequence, which is built into that, is that I could also uh, we have already seen if I whenever I have a, a, a an S N module, I can uniquely decompose it into these isotypic components. I can do the same thing also for this ideal. Also, this ideal has an isotypic decomposition. Any symmetric ideal has an isotypic decomposition. And now I can ask myself again, what is the lambda part of this isotypic decomposition? What is the what is the isotypic part of my ideal corresponding to the representation lambda? And um, and then again, you see that whenever whenever I take a lambda that is dominated by my 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 uh, my dual partition i get from that that this quotient will be zero because the ideal will be contained in the the one ideal will be contained in the other ideal so i quotient it out to zero okay so there's there's a there's a beautiful i mean this was maybe just to motivate that there's a beautiful connection between these ideals that i have and the symmetry action um, of the symmetric group on on my on my affine space, which which can be beautifully understand by understanding these um, these uh, these ideals. Under what condition this goes to zero? Uh, just uh, looking at it. so when you apply the symmetry and uh, Sorry, that perhaps. n approaches to infinity. So which no no this, I mean this this result this result is not just for a fixed n for a fixed n. It says yeah. that whenever you 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 know that this isotypic decomposition will not contain will not contain anything that corresponds to lambda. Okay. Okay. And this is and just trivial. Well, this is this is mostly trivial. It's just you know if one ideal is contained in the other and you intersect it out, then it will not be will not be in the quotient. So it is. Uh, this is an isotypic component of the quotient ring, right? Exactly. It's the isotypic component of the quotient ring, and essentially. It's because your ideal contains so many, your ideal contains so many specked ideals already. You yeah. know that they all be killed in the, in the quotient. That's maybe that's maybe okay. what we're doing. Okay, okay. But it's in, in so now we come to the first question. I mean, this in some sense, I, I'm coming back to my to my to my conjecture that I already had in the other setup. It 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 suggests that this is something is happening here that is sort of independent of n. Now this is stabilizing. This is always zero. And it would be very interesting to understand. Okay, now I I compute a number. Is there is there a polynomial or any regular function that governs these multiplicities for the ones where we don't know if they that they that they are zero? So I could of course also ask myself for lambdas that are not dominated by this by this uh, by this dual partition, and for those lambda. In general, there's no reason to assume that this, this quotient, um, the, the irreducible representation, will not appear in the quotient. I mean, it might appear. And then the question is, its appearance will depend on n. And the question is, how is this governed by n? Um, is there maybe a polynomial again that, that, um, that uh, assigns the multiplicities to this, uh, to this, uh, to, to the to value of n? Uh, so this particular question uh, is uh, uh, stating about uh, the multiplicity, uh, so multiplicity of the spec polynomial, which is coming through 
uh, one young tabula and then under the operation of uh, the symmetric operator exactly okay and i i, I think uh, the multiplicity stay constant when uh, under the symmetric operator or it varies sorry sorry the multiplicity of the spec polynomial stays constant under the symmetric no, operator. No, it doesn't need to. It doesn't need to stay constant. That's the point. I mean, here it stays constant because it's always zero for those. In general, it will go up. It will go up, and the question is, does it always go up in a very predictable way? Uh -huh. I think yes. It should always go up in a predictable way. Um, it should, uh, but we don't know how to prove that. And predictable, I mean, is there's a there's a good function that describes this, maybe a polynomial, maybe a quasi polynomial, maybe another function that you like that that actually describes this. Um, so a very uh, another natural question, of course, is that these are very interesting objects. Do they maybe have a nice Gribner basis? And it turns out that yes, this was conjectured by us, and this was actually also already in this. Thesis of Alexander Wu and and Murai uh, and co-authors showed this and referring to this to the thesis then and then we, we we knew about the thesis. Actually, there is a Gröbner basis which is also understandable in combinatorial terms, and it's actually a universal Gröbner basis, meaning it's a Gröbner basis for all term orders. So the best Gröbner basis you want for this kind of ideals has a very combinatorial description, which is tied to the representation theory of the group. So this is a very beautiful object. I mean, objects, these are, these, are, these, are, these are families of ideals. They are very they are very simple. They look like very simple ideals. They are not so simple after all, but turns out that with all this representation theory at hand, you can actually understand those ideals extremely beautifully. And um, so I just wanted to briefly mention, so this naturally leads to the question, oh, well, I mean, I have the symmetric group. I have other groups that are very similar. Can't I just do the same thing with similar groups? And a PhD student of mine together with other core collaborators of me, we said, yes, this should be obviously doable. So you can define the same thing for the so-called hyperoctahedral group, which is just a symmetric group. With a with a twist, namely you also allow sign changes. Sign partitions. Yeah. Sign it's sign exactly it's sign partitions. Okay. So this group is of course bigger than my symmetric group. It has the factor two to the n um, additional to it. And and uh, and uh, there is a lot of representation theory combinatorial also to that. So it looks very much simpler to the symmetric group, and you would think that. Oh, this should be doable. There is also these these specht modules that are uh, are related to it. There's specht polynomials that can be defined for them. Now the only twist is that instead of one partition, you need two partitions. So you need a B partition, but it's still a very combinatorial object. And we were like very much sure that everything would go on, would go through in the same way. So let me just um, let me just say. So you have a B partition. You have the B partition, so it's it's a set of two partitions. Excuse but some excuse of this... me. Uh, uh, for the previous slide, uh, uh, any change uh, in defining the spec polynomial for the signed partition? Yes, we will, we, will, we will come to that in a moment. Yes, it's a very good question. So I, I just want to show this. I mean, we have now we have B part instead of partitions, we have these B partitions instead of one young tableau. We need to take into account two young tableaus. Again, we have a filling, so we fill in the numbers into this. B tableaus, and we now define an associated Specht polynomial, and this looks very similar. So we take we take these two tableaus, we take the first tableau, T, we associate to this first tableau the normal Specht polynomial that we would associate to a tableau, um, but we, we instead of X, we take X squared in the variables, and then we multiply at the end with all the variables that are in the other, in the other tableau. Without any order, uh, without any distinction of where they actually appear. So, if you look at the tableau that I have here, the B tableau that I have here, I get uh, I get this first this these first three um, pairwise differences of four and eight, ten and seven, six and five, right? But now squared, I have the variable squared, and then at the end I multiply it times x two times x three times x eight. So it it is 
similar to the symmetric uh, to the symmetric definition of the Specht polynomial. Now I have those squares because you, I have this action of of the of the of the sign change that somehow plays a role. So that's where the squares come in, and I also have this product of the individual variables at the end. Uh, so uh, it turns uh, accordion is it uh, is it compatible with the previous one or this is just deliberately modify the definition in this way um what do you mean compatible uh so uh, 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 this particular definition is quite independent of the previous one because uh, you involve the scares here and then the product particularly the last product the last part is completely, I mean, that's that's very independent. Yeah, that's very special for this case. And essentially, actually, this last product is what causes a lot of problems. Uh -huh. But let me just, so I mean, I we gave, so again, you can you can define, you can define a, a dominance order now in beta blows, but there is, it turns out, when you look into the literature, there was a lot of, uh, a lot of ways of defining such uh, B partitions that were not the same. So first hand side, my PhD student Sebastian had to look at all of these and figure out that none of them actually worked in a nice way. So we had to set up a, an, an, another one. And actually, but the interesting thing is, if you use this dominance order, which we basically sort of through brute force calculations came up with as a conjecture, if you use that, you have exactly the very nice similar statement that you have the dominance of the beta blows, so it gives us the inclusion of the ideals, gives you the inclusion of the varieties. And then if you remember what I said previously, of course, this last implications would be trivial if we knew that these ideals were radical and maybe these last inclusions also, I mean, that the last equivalence that I have here suggests that these ideals are radical um, but we could not yet show this. So we actually convinced that they're radical. We, we, we are convinced that they're radical. We computed some examples. Um, and let me also mention, I mean, computing some examples here becomes complicated very quickly because even though this definition is so easy, these ideals become very complicated if you have more than eight, nine variables. And I mean, in all of the instances that we calculated, these ideals were radical and as I said, our theorem seems to suggest that they should be radical, um, but we don't know how to prove it. We tried to adapt the previous proof for the normal Specht polynomials, but exactly the, the issue was that always we ran an issue with this last term here. So these last terms with these products of the, of the variables, this really made a difference somehow and the proof didn't go through, which does not mean that it's not true. Okay. So this is this. I, I just wanted to mention this because there is actually a lot of interesting commutative algebra questions that people have asked for these normal Specht polynomials um, and tied them to to uh, to questions uh, in combinatorics, for example. So exactly, I should mention. So this was also very very fascinating for me. So when we started this, we we had this theorem and then we just tried to find a name for the ideal and we said, oh. Let's just call them Specht ideals because they are Specht ideals. And then we started to Google and then we found out that just uh, two months earlier, somebody named the uh, Yanagawa had, po had posted an article where he where he looks into the coin Macaulay-ness of these ideals, right? So we said, oh, wow, that's interesting. So then we looked at this article and, um, and there's, it turns out there's a lot of people now starting maybe three, four years ago that have looked at all kinds of important questions related to this best ideals. When are they calling Macaulay? Um, when are they reduced? When, 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 do you, when do you have radicality? What are Gribner bases? And so on. For, but these are all for the best ideals of the symmetric group. And so with this first article, we tried to figure out how this generalizes to the setup of the hyperoctahedral group. Um, so this, we, we could show one of the things. We could not even yet show the we could not even yet show the radicality of these ideals. We have also a conjectured Gribner basis. There's also the same idea, the same Gribner basis sort of generalized, should generalize to this hyperoctahedral group. It's absolutely unclear if this, I mean, it seems to work. It seems to be a Gribner basis, but we don't know how to prove it. And then of course it's completely open because I mean, maybe this, these ideals seem to fall a little bit down from the sky the way I defined it, but they are, as I said, they're naturally 
uh, intertwined with representation theory of the symmetric group of the hyperoctahedral group, there's a lot of families of groups where you should be able to define the same kind of the same kind of ideals. And those would be very interesting ideals to study. And I really would like to use this opportunity to make a little bit of commercial for these ideals because they need people that are able, willing, and motivated to study them. And they, they, they really deserve a, a closer look. Uh, and with this, I also wanted to, here you have some references on these, on these Specht ideals. This is the last thing that I now talked about. I also, oops, now I want to go to the first lecture. No, I didn't want to do that. Uh, I also wanted to briefly mention, as I, as, I, as, I, as I said already during the lectures, I had other nice references that I wanted to give you. If you're interested in representation theory in general, there is in particular three books that I would highly recommend, namely the book by Bruce Sagan, The Symmetric Group, which deals about the symmetric group, its representation theory and connections to combinatorics. So if every anything that I've said during these six maybe a long feeling and, and sometimes hard to understand things, uh, lectures, this book will be an eye opener to you and you will see the beauty of the symmetric group and its connections to combinatorics. It's really, it was really for me an eye opener. If you're interested in using linear representations of finite groups and maybe even compact groups for concrete problems that you have in computations, the book by Serre is also something that I can highly recommend. Um, it is a book by Serre, um, which is really applied in many ways. So it actually has a section on applications of uh, representation theory in chemistry, if you're interested in, in this connection. And as a general, as a general, very good introduction to uh, representation theory, the book by Fulton and Harris. When it comes to invariant theory, I already mentioned Burns' book on algorithms in invariant theory. There's also a very good book on classical invariant theory. So classical invariant theory was in particular the, the, the introduction that I gave. So these, these 19th century questions that motivated invariant theory. And if you are interested in, in computational invariant theory, so something that goes a little bit beyond what is in the book by, by Burns, is in the book by Dirksen and Kemper, Computational Invariant Theory. And lastly, I mean, from these applications that I that I try to convey in, sec in, in lecture four and five, um, symmetries and sums of squares I mentioned. So there's this beautiful paper by Gatterman in Paris, which started this whole thing. So all of the things that I explained, the methodology can be found in this paper. If you're then interested in specific groups, so I, I, I and some co-authors, we have some papers where we do this for the symmetry group, for reflection groups, where we use it in polynomial optimization. There's a lot of papers actually that I should have added here as well, where people are using representation theory to simplify things with sums of squares and symmetries. And lastly, for this lecture this morning, I mentioned this article by Prochesi and Schwartz, defining inequalities for orbit spaces. Um, which is uh, an interesting read and 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 can be can be really helpful. I mean, at least the result that it contains can be very helpful also in applied in an applied setup when you're working with real um, symmetries. And lastly, I mean, this conjecture that I mentioned is 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 briefly talked on in this in this paper together with Shogata Basu, where we do this, uh, where we use these Vandermont varieties, mirrored spaces, and the cohomology of symmetric semi-algebraic sets, where we, where we use this to actually efficiently compute all this setup. And with that, I hope you are not as tired as I am, because after speaking so much, I'm very excited, as you can see. I was very excited to bring all of this to you. And maybe sometimes my excitement was <laughs> not to your excitement. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. This can sometimes happen, and it's even worse, of course, if I'm so far away from you, because then it's much harder for me to gauge how you actually felt during these lectures. I still hope, and this is, I think, is the most important thing for me. I still hope that uh, that you get something out of this lecture. And the most important thing for me, and I always tell the students in the beginning, is that I'm not expect you to have completely understood a lot of things. That's maybe that's maybe a very brutal brutal pedagogy, 
but I hope that you have the feeling that now you're on this mountaintop as I was here with my camera and you can finally see into a land that is still far away from you. Maybe maybe you have to swim through a Norwegian for, um, fjord, which is very cold, but actually, essentially you see that there is something very interesting to look at. And I hope that my lecture was an invitation for you to take on this journey and see a little bit more about the beauty that lies on the other side of this fjord, namely in the land of symmetries. And with that, thank you very much for bearing with me through these lectures. And I really, really enjoyed it. And I hope you share my feelings. Thank you. Thank you, Cordy. And thank you very much. Uh, uh, are there any questions from the audience side? Uh, uh, maybe Karachi, uh, you know, now I think uh, Carlos has uh, already departed for the airport. So yes. you can't see him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I could, not, I could not pick him out as a, as a, <laughs> as a generic point. <laughs> <laughs> he was not ge a generic point of this lecture. This was, this le last lecture was different in this particular aspect. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, with Cordian, there there is one one thing. Uh, uh, may you please open uh, uh, that particular slide where you were uh, discussing about uh, hyper uh, the the group with the sign permutation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, okay, uh, up up till now you uh, hyper octa octahedral group. So uh, you are working with the, this particular sign partition, and uh, you define the spec polynomial in this particular aspect. Uh, there is a generalization exists for this particular group where people deal with the uh, R signed part partitions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can, I mean, this, this is a very good, this is a very good question. So you can actually, so I, I don't know how they are called, but I mean, they, 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 the way you, where you have more than, uh, um, but of course, this is a very natural first candidate where you could sort of hope. I mean, I, I'm actually almost sure. I should mention that, I mean, Specht, Specht introduced the Specht polynomials first for the symmetric group and then for this hyperoctahedral group. There is a group of Japanese mathematicians in the late oh. 90s who generalized this construction also to all these kind of cross product groups. Um, so there, there might be already this, the, the definition, the right definition of these Specht polynomials might be already there. I'm not mistaken for those groups as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, the question, I mean, the ideals, uh, the, the, the polynomials are there, but I'm pretty sure nobody has really understood the ideals completely yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As and, here, uh, even in this simple example, we, mm -hmm. I mean, we have the first step, but there's so much left to see in these ideals. And uh, uh, how how you are uh, just I want to uh, it was very quick this this particular part, so uh, <laughs> how you are uh, how you are taking care of the negative sign here ah, uh, so, under consideration. Um, <coughs> what do you mean? How do I take care of this? Yeah. Maybe. What do you mean by how I take care of this? Uh, how you are building the spec polynomial uh, for the. Ah. For the because uh, I, I was just expecting. Let me just share my feeling. When yes. you were dealing this uh, sign permutation, I was expecting that you are going to increase your variable to two n as well. Yes, I mean, ah, uh -huh. so this, so you see, I mentioned this here. So you can, if you want, you can think of this group a little bit as a subgroup of the two n. Two n, yeah, as two n. So yeah, only where you have negative and positive, then it's a subgroup. This, this you could do, and this gives you exactly. I mean. This gives you this unique uh, product decomposition of an element in this negative and positive side. I mean, then in one, I mean, the one part, the first n you call the positive, the last n you call the negative, and then you have this, you have this, you have the thing, which gives you the result. The only result that we sort of need is that you have the conjugation classes of this group correspond to pairs of tableaus. And so if you want to, uh, maybe this is your question, maybe, maybe if you want to, I mean, the sign change lives in the mm -hmm. second tableau. The second, uh, in the tableau, second, yeah. So the, the first one is for is the positive, the for the positive exactly. side. Second one exactly. is for the negative. Okay, okay. okay. Exactly, okay. exactly. Maybe okay. I should have said this is this is why these B tableaus come about. Uh, exactly. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, I... And uh, uh, this n is uh, definitely uh, in this particular case. This is the two n kind of thing, right? 
if you are mm -hmm. I, I you understand my point or for instance uh, when you were discussing about uh, the first case when the symmetric group was acting on it and mm -hmm. uh, then there was n variable so mm -hmm. in this particular scenario the number of variable increased it's, it's still because n, of still the n. still n it's still n i mean that's the definition i mean just how you write them yeah that's still n um Ah, because, okay, I mean, okay. Is, if the negative, okay, will, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Good, So you have the first, you have the first variables. Maybe that's the thing. Yeah, you have yeah, the yeah. First yeah, a sigma variable. minus one is equal to minus sigma one. Yeah, under that particular condition, the variable will appear only once. Okay, okay. I was exactly. just. Yeah, yeah, under that condition. Maybe, okay, maybe, okay. Maybe, maybe let me give you another interesting. Maybe I think that that explains it a little bit better the connection. So I mean, x i minus x j is just the hyperplane that corresponds to a flip of the coordinates, right? Xj, Xj minus Xy, the, the, the hyperplane that's given by this expression, is just the, the coordinate shift uh, of these two coordinates. So mm -hmm. what you do in the special polynomial actually is you multiply some reflection hyperplanes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. here in, in this BN case, you additionally have these reflection hyperplanes on the coordinate uh, where you go from minus to plus. So that's why you have this X0, uh, x2 x3 and x9 if you want to and and cordian what was the motivation of uh, in, in introducing the power and the product term in the end for this particular case spec polynomial for this particular is it but introduced in this particular is, way or i mean there was the, thing is defined in this, so the, the question is okay i mean why did we define i mean we didn't define it spec defined it like this so yeah. what spec wanted to do is he wanted to define polynomials that give you the irreducible representations of these groups. Uh -huh. So for the for the and and as you as you maybe recall from one of the lectures, the number of irreducible representations is exactly the same as the conjugacy classes of my group. In the symmetric group case, there is the number of conjugacy classes is exactly the number of the number of um, the number of partitions. So for every partition, you have a conjugacy class. For every conjugacy class, you get you get uh, you get uh, you get an irreducible representation. So so what what Specht wanted to do is he wanted to construct these Specht polynomials as as irreducible representations. And then it turns out that for this BN case, you need these polynomials to construct the irreducible oh. representations. Okay, okay, okay. So it's a so kind of... Maybe a... What, I, what I want to say, this motivates these polynomials because they're not just arbitrarily polynomials that I just assigned. They really are deeply related to the representations <laughs> of these groups. Interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. And uh, in, in that particular construction, this is just a question out of this particular... So it, it does it has any relationship with the Coxter group there? In what sense? Coxter, Coxter group, which is coming out of the matrices to describe the wild group classification categories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I'm again. Uh, this, is, this is this is completely representative. No, this is the problem. Now you say something, I say something, and then then this is this is on the internet for the rest of eternity. Yeah. So I <laughs> this is <laughs> that. Yeah, this was a very vague question. Of no, the but, let, me, let me think a little bit about this because I think the answer is yes, but I have to see how to really make this connection. Yeah, but uh, very very interesting. Very interesting. I'm looking at these things for the very first time. Yeah. So, are there any other questions from the audience? Oh. I think Alicia joined, I think. Okay, uh, if this is the case, let us thank uh, Cordian. Cordian, thank you very much for your, uh, for your time and uh, for accepting our invitation and being the part of uh, this uh, Simpa School. And your pres presence was uh, really very value adding, and uh, because you introduce a new horizon to uh, to the problems and the theory, what was discussed in all the lectures. So, uh, huge huge round of applause to you. Thank you very much. Let me just also once more say I'm really sorry that I couldn't make it, and I really would have hoped to be having been able to meet all of you. And I really hope that I will meet some of you again as mathematicians. Um, I mean, young mathematicians become mathematicians, or we are already all mathematicians. 
but to see you at some conference or as I said, there is this nice possibility of coming to Norway, two of you uh, in the fall. I would be really looking forward and maybe to work on such questions. Okay, okay. I hope uh, you will, uh, we will see many people working. Uh, maybe there are many questions and all of them are quite steep heighted, but uh, definitely uh, I think uh, your, uh, your lectures were really stepping stone for moving in this particular direction. So anyways, for the participant, I repeat once again that uh, we are putting all the recordings and everything on the, and lecture notes and everything 